Hi guys, welcome to our video about table FRQs. So what is a table FRQ? Um, well, pretty simple. It's whenever you give in an FRQ and they give you a table of values. And we're going to be looking at some pretty common questions that are associated with these types of FRQs on the Calculus ABF uh, exam. So let's begin here. Now, I think one of the problems with this is that so many of the questions look the same, and yet they really are asking you to do different things. So um, here we've got some really common questions that they ask, and then we'll talk about units, and then we'll get into some practice problems. So sometimes they'll say, <clears throat> estimate the instantaneous rate of change, or they might just say, estimate this, right? But the table only has F values in it. So how can you find an instantaneous rate when your table only has F values in it? Well, the answer is you can't. You can only estimate it, and you estimate it doing um, an average rate of change. And the principle behind that is, is that, well, I might know this point here and this point here, um, and there's my curve. Now, I don't know what the instantaneous rate of change is right here, but if I could pick two points that are really close to that and find the slope of the, the secant line, that's going to be pretty much the same thing as the slope of the tangent line. The slope of the tangent line is the instantaneous rate, whereas the slope of the secant line, which we can find by just doing y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, will be pretty much the same. And so you can't really find an exact derivative from a table, um, but what you can do is you can estimate by picking two points really close to it. So if they ever say estimate, and then they give you like a derivative, or they say instantaneous rate, we're going to be doing this method here. And this can be anywhere from one to two points. They usually ask you to include the units. So if they do that, it's definitely going to be like, well, actually, I've, I've seen them actually ask both questions where they, they ask for the answer and the units, and they still only make it one point. So it depends. But sometimes they can make it worth two points. It just kind of varies. <clears throat> um, now, I'm going to skip this next one here. Um, I'm going to jump down here to average rate of change. This is really the same question it's just asked in a different way they'll just say find the average rate of change well guess what it's the same formula because that's how you estimate an instantaneous rate is with an average rate so it's really just the same question units are often included and it's one to two points but you have to understand the differences between those questions the way that you solve them is the same but what they're asking is different on this one you're actually finding an average rate on number on the first one we talked about you're estimating an instantaneous rate by using an average rate, okay? So there's very subtle difference in the interpretation of what's going on, but the process is identical. And then there's another one that's almost identical to it too, and that's this guy right here. <clears throat> Sometimes, you know, if, let's say you have a table, and in your table there's a, a value given for f, right? And they say, is there a time when the derivative equals something in particular? Well, that's a mean value theorem problem. Um, and basically what you do is guess what? You find the average rate of change again using the two numbers that they give you in the interval. And hopefully if it works out, it, it's K, right? So you're thinking, wow, it's the same question, just asked three different ways. And that, that's true. Um, but for the MVT, it, you have to be a little bit more specific. So notice they're not asking what's the average rate. Notice they're not asking you to estimate an instantaneous rate. What they're asking here is they're asking you, is there a time when the instantaneous rate equals something specific? And that's a different question. The process is very similar, but it's a different question. Now for this one, you do have to do a little bit more work than you have to do with the first two. Because with the first two, even though the questions are different, the work is identical. For this one, the question's different and the work requires a little bit more. Yes, you still do this, but you have to make a sentence of this sort. You would say something like, since the function is continuous and differentiable on the interval that they provide, there must be some value of C where the instantaneous rate equals the average rate. Okay, and the principle behind that, I'll explain it real quick, is if I'm going from point A to point B and I've got a continuous and differentiable curve, meaning it's smooth with no holes, gaps, or jumps, 
then whatever this slope is from beginning to end, that's the average rate, there has to be some instantaneous rate along that curve, in other words, a tangent line, that is parallel to the secant line. Okay, and so that's the idea there. So it is a very different idea, and yet the process is very similar. So we have those three questions, and they're pretty darn similar. Um, but there are some subtle and important differences. So let's, let's highlight those real quick. Um, you don't have to highlight them on your paper if you don't want to, but I'm just pointing it out again. So estimating instantaneous rates with average rates, or simply finding average rates, or doing the mean value theorem, okay? All three of those require the use of this little formula here. Um, but with instantaneous rates, you have to pick the two values closest to the value they're asking for the instantaneous rate of. For average rate, they just give them to you. And then for MVT, they typically just give them to you also, but you have to include this long, crazy sentence with it, okay? So those things are all similar. Now, let's take a look at another type of question that's pretty similar to the MVT, and yet it is subtly different. For the M MVT, notice it says, is there a time when F prime is equal to K? But look at the IVT. Is there a time when F equals K? Okay, so once again, you have a table, right? And in the table, let's just say there's this function F. Well, if they're asking about the derivative, does the derivative ever equal something special? That's an MVT problem. But if they're asking about if the function itself, just F, equals something specific, that's an IVT. Now let's talk about the concept behind that one. If I'm going from point A to point B, then if I've got a continuous line, I have to cross some middle point. That's the idea there with the IVT. So it's different. It has nothing to do with slopes. Okay, it just has to do with y values. So for that one, so long as the function is just continuous, it, unlike MVT, it doesn't require differentiability because it has nothing to do with slopes. But so long as it's continuous, you would say this statement here, um, since f is continuous on a, b, and goes from f of a to f of b, there must be some value c such that f of c equals k. Now, you have to make sure that your f of a and your f of b are actually <clears throat> surrounding the k value. You know, so if you're saying, oh, look, I'm down here at 0, and now I'm up here at 8, if my k value is anywhere between 0 and 8, then, yes, I have to equal that value at some point in time. Okay, but if it's not in the interval, you couldn't do it. Now, just so you guys know, um, there are circumstances where, you know, that, that these won't apply, but very often um, you're just going to answer them. The answer is typically yes. You just have to, you know, show your work and show that it's yes. Every once in a while they could ask one where it's not possible. They might say, is it possible to use the MVT or is it possible to use the IVT? If they ask that kind of a question, then there might be a discontinuity or something where which would disqualify the use of these theorems. But for the most part, if they just say this, is there a time when f prime of c equals k, um, the answer is going to be yes to that. If they say, is it possible to use the MVT or IVT? Well, that, that's, that's open area. It, it, that depends on the continuity of the function. But if they just ask it like this, the answer is yes, and you just write these sentences out. Okay. So, so far we've seen that there are um, three pri types of problems that are pretty similar. Finding instantaneous, estimating instantaneous rates, finding average rates, and doing the MVT. Furthermore, we found that the MVT and the IVT are also pretty similar to each other. Um, now let's take, let's point out another subtle difference in all of these problems. We talked about the average rate of change, right, earlier, where we, um, <clears throat> we use that little formula here. Well, that's different than asking what's the average value of something, okay? What this is, is this is the average slope. And that's why we use the slope formula. Okay, this is the average y value or f value, if you will. And that's a very different question. Um, for those ones, we're using this integral formula here. All right, and what, what this represents here is this represents the sum of all the values of f. And this one down here represents um, how many f values there are. And so when you take a function, you divide by how many there are, that gives you the average value, right? Um, 
it's kind of interesting too. We'll talk about the units in a minute, but for now the, the units output there is kind of interesting. So now we see another similarity. We've seen that average rate is a lot like average value and yet they're completely different. Like their, their wording seems the same and yet the process is completely different. The process is completely different for those. So you're seeing there's a ton of similarity in these questions. <clears throat> now, just so you guys know, anytime you're finding an integral of the function that's in the table, you're, you're probably going to have to do some kind of a Riemann sum or something. So let's take a look at these two. Now, the, the last two types of questions that look pretty similar are this one and this one. Now, once again, we're, we're saying that I've got this table. Oops. Let me close that. I'm saying that I have like this table here of f. Well, if they ask you to integrate that function, then you're going to be doing a right-hand, left-hand, midpoint, or trapezoidal sum. That that's the only way to do that. And it's an estimate. It's, it's an estimate. It's not an exact value. It's an area under the curve, and you can't actually get it because you're estimating it with geometric shapes. Okay. Um, but if they ask this, you're just going to apply the fundamental theorem of calculus because the integral of f prime is f, and those numbers are in the table. So we can actually get an exact answer in that case. Sometimes, by the way, with these ones where you can actually do the integration, u substitution is required. Um, it just depends on if there's something inside the parentheses there. All right. Um, so if you ever have to um, do an average value, just so you know, well, that requires an integral of the function that they gave you. And therefore, you're going to have to do some kind of a left hand, right hand, midpoint or trapezoid sum for those ones. OK, so there's a lot of overlap in these questions, and yet they are all subtly different. Some of them even have some different processes. Now, let's, re let's review something. Um, we talked about if I have a function and its input units are x and its output units are y, then an instantaneous rate, in other words, f prime of x, its units are y per x. OK, the same thing applies for an average rate. So if you had f of b minus f of a over b minus a, that was also y per a. And that makes sense, y per x. And that makes sense because these are y values and these are x values. So you end up with y per x. And since average and instantaneous are just estimates of each other, then it makes sense that they have the same units. OK, now. Something that we talked about back when we did rate in and rate out questions is if you ever take a function and you integrate it with respect to x, you lose the x variable. You know, so like, for instance, if you had y per x, if you integrated this and it was, let's say that f was y per x and you integrate it, you lose the x. Well, interestingly enough, though, whenever you have this um, and then you put this in the front, you're putting the x back because these are x values. So even though the integral gets rid of the x in the denominator as the units, this puts it back. So average value, the average value of a function, the units match the original function. Okay. So in summary, I have this little paragraph or bulleted section here for you. So given that f of x equals y, if the units of f of x are y and the units of x are t, then, and I meant to change these, let me go back and change this real quick to t values. Um, then the units of the instantaneous rate is y per t. The average rate is y per t. The average value is just y, like the function itself. All right, so some points about units there to keep in mind. All right, and a lot of these questions, as you guys can see, are just one to two point values. Now, once again, this is not an exhaustive list of all the different types of questions that they could ask, but it is a summary of the most common types of questions. So let's go ahead and take a look at our first one. So in this problem, we're talking about a metal wire that's eight centimeters long, and it's being heated on one end. As a result, at the very tip of the wire where the heat is happening, then that's where it's gonna be hottest. And as we get farther along the wire, the heat transfers along, but you lose heat along the way because of the room temperature, and so the drop, the heat starts decreasing. So the table above gives selected values of the temperature T in degrees Celsius of the wire X centimeters from the heated end. The function T is decreasing and twice differentiable. 
So notice our units. The input units are CM and the output units are degrees Celsius. All right, so let's keep all those things in mind. And let's begin with question one. Question one says, find the average rate of change of T on the interval one to eight, and then provide the correct units. Okay, so notice this is asking for an average rate. It's not asking for an average value. Average rate means we're gonna be doing our little formula here. And in this case, we're going from one to eight. So that'd be here, 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 and here. So T of eight is 55. T of 1 is 93. 55 minus 93 is going to be negative 38 over 7. Now, what are the units? Well, for average rate, it's going to be the output units over the input units. So that's degrees Celsius per centimeter. And so that means that on average, we can interpret this, but on average, the temperature of the wire is decreasing by 38 degrees uh, every seven centimeters on average. That's what that would mean. Um, so that's the average rate of change. Now, the next question is, says estimate T prime of seven and interpret the results using the correct units. Well, this is an instantaneous rate of change. So that's part of the interpretation there. Um, we want to estimate it, though, because the way that you estimate an instantaneous rate of change is, guess what? Just doing the average rate again. But this time, we want to pick the two T values that are closest to 7. So the two T values that are closest to 7 are 6 and 8. So I'll be using these numbers then. So the instantaneous rate of change of our function at 7 is approximately, so I'm going to use some squiggly lines here, uh, 55 minus 62 over 8 minus 6, okay? And so that would be um, negative 7 over 1. And so what would our interpretation be? Well, this has the same units as the other one. It's going to be um, degrees Celsius per centimeter. Um, so what is our interpretation? That means that at t equals 7, that's my input time, or it's not time. Matter of fact, I need to change that. It's not t at all, is it? It's x. Um, at x equals 7 centimeters, the temperature is decreasing. Why is it decreasing? Well, because I've got a negative temperature here. It's decreasing at a rate of seven degrees Celsius per centimeter, okay? And so that's what that means. All right, let's go ahead and move along to question number three. And by the way, this would this could be a two to three point question, you know? You have the interpretation, that could be one point. You have the units, that could be a point. And then you have the actual answer, which could be another point. Um, I doubt it would be just one point, so it could be two or three points for this type of question. Um, you do want to make sure that with your um, interpretations, they have the input units, they have the output units, and then the context of the problem. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at number three. Is there a distance along the interval five to six for which t prime of x equals negative eight? So they're asking, is there a time when the derivative of the function in the table equals something? That's an MVT question, okay? So we're gonna take the interval that they give us and guess what? We're gonna do the average rate again for the interval five to six. So we would say, let's go ahead and calculate it first. 62 minus 70 over six minus five is equal to negative eight over one. So sure enough, yes, it works. Now here's how you would word that question. You would say, since T, is continuous on the interval 5, 6, and differentiable on the interval 5, 6, there must be 
some value x, y, x, usually we use c, right? But I'm using x because that's what they have here. There must be some value x for which t prime of x is equal to, and then you should show this work here. Oops, you should show that work. Um, 62 minus 70 over 6 minus 5 equals negative 8, and then you're done. Okay, so that's my answer with my explanation. And once again, those questions can be worth one to two points, um, one for your explanation part and one for showing that math work down there. But it could also just be worth one. Once again, just depends on how they want to split the points up. All right. So we have saw the three ways that a question could be asked, all of which use an average rate of change of some kind. Okay, now we're going to switch gears here. Is there a distance along the interval 5, 6, which t of x equals 65? Notice how similar question 4 looks like question 3. The difference lies in question 3. We're asking about a derivative. This one's just asking about the function. Okay, well, that's the, whenever we're asking just about the function, that's an IVT question. Okay. So, first of all, you know, is this function continuous? Yes, it is because it's differentiable. Second of all, what's going on on the interval from 5 to 6? It looks like my temperature is going from 70 to 62. So if I'm going from 70 to 62, would it have to equal 65 at some point? Yeah. There's no way your temperature on your thermometer or whatever could drop from 70 to 62 without being 65 at some point. Well, that's just the IVT. So it has to be continuous, and the number that they give you has to be between the two other values on the table. And if both of those things work, and by the way, they usually do, um, you can just go on with your sentence, and here's how you'd say it. You would say, since T is continuous on 5, 6, and goes from... 70 to 62 on that interval. There must be some value x such that t of x equals 65. Okay, and so that's your IVT. That's your IVT. All right. Let's go ahead and transition here to number five. Find and interpret this. Now, notice the similarity between question five and question six and the difference between them. On question five, it's T prime, but on question six, it's just T. Whenever it's T prime, in other words, when it's the derivative of the function that's actually in the table, we can actually just do the fundamental theorem of calculus. Why is that? Because I can actually integrate t prime. If you integrate t prime, you get t. And then I can just plug in the 8, and I can plug in the 0 and subtract them. t of 8 is 55, and t of 0 is 100. And the difference of those is negative 45. Now, they do want us to interpret this. They do want us to interpret this. So you kind of have to be sharp with your units here. Um, let's take a look. Uh, here we have 8 and 0. Well, what are those? Those are distances along the wire, right? 8 and 0 are the distances along the wire. What are the 55 and the 100? Well, those are temperatures along the wire. So it looks like from the distance 0 to 8, the temperature dropped from 100 degrees to 55 degrees. In other words, it decreased by 45 degrees. So our interpretation of this would be as follows. The temperature of the wire decreased by 45 degrees Celsius on the interval 0 centimeters to 8 centimeters. All right, once again, my interpretation has the input units, 
it has the output units, and then the context of the problem is the rest of it. Um, you would still need to show all this work also. Um, this would probably be anywhere from a two to a three point question. One point for calculating the correct answer, and one point for the interpretation, possibly one point for getting the units correct in the process, all right? Now let's take a look at question number six. Question number six is a different one, although it looks very similar. It's a subtle difference in the way it's written. Like I said, up here in question five was t, the integral t prime. Well, the integral t prime is just t, so you can just use the table to find the t values and integrate it. But for question six, how would you integrate t? I don't know what the integral of t is. I can't actually integrate the function because there's no function to integrate. I just have some specific numbers along the way. But I don't have a function where I can you know, do the power rule or anything like that. So how do we do that? Well, they tell you how to do that. We're going to use the right ream on sum. So that's what's kind of nice about these ones. They're going to tell you what method to use. Okay. So after we do our right ream on sum to estimate this, we're going to indicate whether this is an underestimate or an overestimate. So how do we do a right ream on sum again? Um, well, let's see. You have to find your base lengths. How far apart are each of those numbers in the input row? And then if it's a right ream on sum, we start on the right and we exclude the last number on the left and we just multiply. So it's going to be 55 times 2, 62 times 1, 70 times 4, 93 times 1. So that's going to look like this, 93 times 1 plus 70 times 4 plus 62 times 1 plus 55 times 2. And there's our answer. Now, we could we could work this out. You don't technically have to because it's an FRQ. I'm going to go ahead and simplify it. Um, I'm getting 545. All right. Um, now, is this an overestimate or an underestimate? Now, if you guys like to just memorize things, you can memorize the rules. I like to figure things out. So I noticed that my function is decreasing. So I've got a function that's going in a downward direction. I'm noticing that we have a right ream on sum. So what would that look like? If I'm drawing rectangles where the right corner is touching the curve, it would be underneath of the curve. And so therefore I know this is an underestimate. Now you have to explain that though, of course. So I would say, since we are doing a right ream on sum and the function t of x, is decreasing, our estimate is an underestimate. Okay, so you're going to get definitely one or two points for calculating this correctly, and you're going to get one point for your explanation. So this is at least a two point question, possibly a three. Now, I just want you guys to know I like to show my work like this on the table, but uh, on your FRQ exam, that's not, you can do this on your exam, but they're not going to grade this because the question that they're asking is going to be separate from this. And they only grade work that's in the written space that they provide you. And since this is part of the question, that's not going to be in the written space that they provide you. So make sure you do take the time to write this at least in your written space. Otherwise, they're not going to give you any credit. They will not give you credit for showing work on the table because it's not in the written space. Okay, so keep that in mind. All right, last question says, use your answer from number six to find the average temperature. Now we did an average problem earlier, average rate of change, but this is not asking for an average rate of change of our function. It's asking us to find the average T value, the actual average temperature, not the average slope. And so for that, we're gonna use our little average value formula. Now, notice that it says use your answer from number six, and that's because we have no way of getting this without doing some kind of a Riemann sum. And we did that already. We found out that that was 545. And I'm just going to leave my answer like that because I can. Um, and what that would be is that would be the average temperature. So they didn't ask for units, so you don't need to put them. And I, I wouldn't, honestly, just in case you're wrong. Um, unless they ask for it, but I'll put it just for the heck of it. It is degrees Celsius. Um, and once again, that's probably about a one or two point question. All right. 
So those are your common types of questions for table FRQs. Um, so hopefully that was helpful, and we'll see you guys to practice this stuff in class later on. Have a good one.